There are no statements more comforting and reassuring to believers than to hear Christ declare, it is finished. As Jesus was lifted up onto a a Roman cross, had the nails hammered through his wrists, and as he was whipped, spat at and mocked, he was hours away from completing his mission. God's plan for salvation was nearly complete. This bloody, violent event is the pinnacle of God's redemptive plan. The cruel and degrading method chosen to murder Christ provided the worst imaginable way to be killed, that of crucifixion. It was designed to be torturous and drawn out. This wicked punishment was designed to break somebody physically and mentally and to send a loud, clear warning to any spectators of the cost of coming up against the Roman Empire. It's not hard, is it, for us to understand the horror of the cross, this horrible, wicked and shameful death. Jesus' loving willingness to give himself to the cross brings together the conclusion of Christ's perfect obedience and the end to a number of important things. A number of things finished upon that cross and the heartbeat of our triumphant gospel. And that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. When Christ said, it is finished, what was finished? What was Jesus talking about? As we study that this morning, it's worth us noting that Jesus was recorded in the Gospels as saying a number of important things from upon that cross. Things that you may be familiar with that are often referred to as the seven words of the cross. We're going to be focusing on the second to last statement this morning. But before we go there, let us remind ourselves of the other six things that Jesus said. Tom Pennington, an excellent expository preacher in America, has provided some helpful notes. He points out that Jesus made three of these seven statements between 9 a.m. and noon. This was between the time he was crucified and noon when the darkness fell. The first word from Jesus on the cross was recorded in Luke chapter 23, verse 34, when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Luke then records the second statement in verse 43 of that same chapter. Truly, I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. This, of course, was addressed to the thief who had believed. The third word was to his mother. When he said, woman, behold your son. And to John the apostle, behold your mother. And then, of course, from noon until three o'clock in the afternoon, complete darkness fell and covered the land. And during those three hours, Jesus was silent. Just before 3 p.m. on that Friday afternoon, Jesus made a series of four other statements from the cross in quick succession. The fourth statement is found in Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, when he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is where we we get to the heart of what's really going on during those hours of darkness. When Christ was forsaken for all of those who would believe in him. We'll be looking at the fifth and sixth statement in just a few moments, so we'll Talk about those then. And then finally, in Luke chapter 23, verse 46, Jesus says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Of course, every one of these statements by Christ would be worthy of a a lengthy study. And maybe one day we can do that. We'd be in great company if we did. Charles Spurgeon once said that these passages have an ocean of meaning in a drop of language. He said it would need all of the words that were ever spoken or ever can be spoken to explain this one event. So with that in mind, please turn with me to John chapter 19. That's page 905 in the church Bible. That's John chapter 19.
We're going to be reading from verse 28. It's John chapter 19 from verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I first. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. The most significant thing to happen in human history is the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our saviour does not stay dead. Our king is alive right now. We'll be celebrating this very fact on Sunday. One of the many things that I find remarkable about the Bible is how Jesus, throughout the 33 years he lived on earth, fulfilled over 300 prophecies. And here he is, knowing that the time is near for him to die, and yet there is one more prophecy about his death on the cross that had yet to be fulfilled. Knowing this, Jesus sets his attention to fulfill it. That's verse 28. To fulfill the scripture, Jesus cries out, I first. And here we see through sovereign providence, absolute control over every iota of history. Jesus' first is used to fulfill one of the last remaining Old Testament prophecies regarding the Messiah written about a thousand years before it was fulfilled on this day. The psalmist writes in Psalm 22, verse 15, My strength is dried up, my tongue cleaves to my jaws, and you lay me in the dust of death. And in Psalm 69, verse 21, we read, For my first they gave me sour wine to drink. This is just remarkable, isn't it? Jesus physically destroyed and exhausted, and yet still in absolute control. Christ knew that there was still a little work to do before he can say, it is finished. And then in verse 30, Jesus now, having received the sour wine, fulfills the final prophecy concerning himself on the cross. And then knowing this, he shouts out, it is finished. It was the shout of victory. It is finished. Three words in our English language, but one word in Greek. The word tetelestai. Tetelestai is a Greek accounting term that means paid in full. Here he is declaring that his work in being treated as a guilty sinner on the cross, by having God's wrath poured out on him, he has paid the debt for those that are his. And of course, this was not Christ's debt. He is perfect. He didn't have any. This was the eternal debt owed by sinners that were his. Wiped away completely and forever, completely paid up, paid in full to tell us that. So as Jesus shouts this out so that all can hear with one of his last breaths, what was within the scope of what he was declaring as finished. Well, first of all, as we, as we mentioned a few moments ago, Jesus came and he fulfilled all of the Old Testament prophecies about his first coming. That's the message here in verse 28. After this, Jesus knowing that all things had already been accomplished, he knew that all of those prophecies regarding the cross had been fulfilled in him. And this worked out, of course it did, exactly like Jesus told everyone it would. Turn back a few pages to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, verse 31. This is a week before the crucifixion on the way to Jerusalem. Listen to what Jesus told his disciples. And taking the twelve, he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. The key word here, everything. 
There's not a single Old Testament prophecy about Christ's first coming that Jesus did not fulfill. Not one. When you meet someone in the street and they say, how can you be so sure that the Bible is true? You just want to sit them down and walk through every single prophecy and its fulfillment, don't you? It's just remarkable. The most sophisticated computer in the world couldn't come up with something so infinitely complex and yet so simple. And Spurgeon says something similar here. He says, give the Old Testament to the wisest person alive and say to them, take this puzzle, go home and construct in your imagination an ideal character who shall fit exactly all that which is foreshadowed. And remember, he must be a prophet like Moses, a champion like Joshua. He must be an Aaron, a Melchizedek. He must be both David and Solomon, Noah and Jonah, Judah and Joseph. Not just that, he must not only be the lamb that was slain and the scapegoat that was not slain, the turtle dove that was dipped in blood and the priest who slew the bird, but he must be the altar, the tabernacle and the mercy seat. And not just that, to puzzle the wise man further, we remind him of prophecies that seem so apparently contradictory that one would think that it would be impossible in one man. Such as these. All kings shall fall down before him and all nations shall serve him. And yet he is despised and rejected of man. He must begin by showing a man born of a virgin. He must be a man without spot or blemish but yet one upon whom the Lord does cause to meet the iniquities of us all. Just blows your mind, doesn't it? It's impossible in the flesh. So that's the first thing, the fulfillment of every Old Testament prophecy concerning himself up to death, finished. But that's not all. There was something else completed upon that cross. As the precious blood of Jesus the sinless, spotless Lamb of God was shed, it points us to the second thing that was finished in Christ. The ultimate sacrifice put an end to the sacrificial system. The blood of these Old Testament sacrificial animals, they held no power of their own. Instead, they pointed to the blood of Christ. This is why they had to keep on making sacrifices over and over again. In fact, the repetition of these sacrifices were a witness to their ineffectiveness. They simply provided the reminder that something needed to be done to atone for sins. It just kept highlighting the point that another sacrifice was needed. And of course, the only blood that is capable of washing away sin, the only blood that can satisfy the wrath of God for the payment of sins is that of the perfect substitute, our perfect saviour, our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what these animals were doing. They were teaching the idea of substitution, that it was possible to have sin placed on another, of course, pointing to Christ and the cross. And this may lead you to ask a common question. So how were the people in the Old Testament saved? And the answer is the same as us today, by faith. Stephen Lawson writes on this subject, he says, In the Old Testament, people were saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, looking ahead into the future, to the coming of Christ. Maybe you remember Jesus saying in John chapter 8, verse 56, Abraham saw my day and he was glad. And today, for us, thousands of years later, at this moment of time when we are born, we're able to look back, aren't we, to the first coming of Christ. We can articulate this because we have the closed canon of scripture. We can talk about Jesus who died on the cross, bearing our sins. But in the Old Testament, they were simply looking ahead to the coming of Christ. They looked forward we look back and it's there where we all meet at the foot of the cross. It's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, that anyone is saved. This brings us on to the third thing, finished in Christ. For those that are truly his, the power, 
the guilt and punishment for sin is finished, paid in full. That's what Jesus is doing right here on the cross. Jesus was guilty of nothing. He lived a perfect life, and yet he has willingly received the penalty of sin. Upon the cross, the Father treated him as if he had personally committed every sin by every individual who would ever believe in the history of the world. This isn't just some kind of abstract, far-off idea. If you are a Christian, we're talking about the penalty of your sin, of my sin. In fact, sin is the only thing that we contribute to the whole of the gospel message. It is our sin that made the cross necessary in the first place. Every time that you have lied, thought an evil thought, been angry, failed to love and honour God in the way in which he demands, then here he is paying for your individual sin upon that cross. Every past sin. Every sin committed on this very day and every sin in the future until his return for those in Christ. It's why Christians can say with absolute confidence that if they were to die today, they know for sure where they will, that they will be saved and where they are going. I never used to understand that. Before I was a Christian, I thought that was so arrogant and proud. But it's the opposite. I'm not confident because of anything within myself. Absolutely not. On the day of judgment, my plea is guilty that as Christians, we are known and loved by the one who is not. Jesus. It is him where my confidence and my assurance is rooted. His perfect life, not mine. It's his blood applied to the sinner where salvation is found. That's why true Christians know that they are going. It's not because we claim to be better than anyone else. The opposite is true. It's because we know of our guilt and we have received God's grace and forgiveness because of Christ. Though he was blameless, he faced the full fury of God's wrath, enduring the penalty of sin on behalf of those that he came to save. In this way, the sinless Son of God became the perfect substitute for sinners. And as a result of Christ's sacrifice, in the same way that the Father treated the Son as a sinner, even though his Son was sinless, the Father now treats believers as righteous, even though they are unrighteous. It's just incredible, isn't it? It's a great exchange. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What an incredible truth for Christians, that Christ's death on this cross has indeed given us eternal life in him. How can this not ignite our worship and make us ask ourselves, well, how how can I respond to this? All that he has done for me, Jesus, how can I follow you? How can I honour you? How can I glorify you for the rest of my days? And if you're a true Christian, here this morning or watching online, all of this is true for you. As we draw to a close, it would be unloving of me not to talk about something else that one day will be finished if you are not a true Christian. And please listen to me, this is so important. One day... The way of salvation will be finished. God's abounding grace for sinners will finish. There will come a time when it's no longer possible to call out for mercy and to be forgiven. That time will finish. You do not know what tomorrow will bring, so this is of absolute first importance. And it's a lie from the enemy, isn't it, that you will always have tomorrow. Our hearts are so quick to deceive us. Ah, yeah, I'll start reading my Bible once I've finished this big project at work. I'll start going to church and listening to all that Jesus stuff. Once my kids have got older, it will be easier then. I want to enjoy my life. Let me just live my best life now. And then before I get really old and die, that's when I will put my faith in Christ. 
Because Jesus told a parable against this kind of thinking. In Luke chapter 12, verse 16, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store all my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger barns. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you've got plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. And God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Friends, tomorrow is not promised. And what happens when this rich man with the harvests, life is taken from him? If he's not in Christ, if he's not been born again, if he's not repented and put his faith in Christ, then the opportunity for salvation has gone forever. Finished. To help me illustrate this point, cast your minds back to the, to the time of Noah. A Bible story that I'm sure you'll remember, who was born at a time when there was great wickedness on the earth. God, seeing this utter corruption and violence, told Noah that he was going to destroy the earth and everything in it via a flood. You may remember Noah was told to to build an ark which would be used as a vessel to save him and his family. Now this ark was no small boat. This ark was huge. According to the answers in Genesis website, it's likely that it took between 55 and 75 years for Noah to build it. To give you an idea of its size, it was about 510 foot long. That's the size of nearly one and a half football pitches. 50 foot tall, so the size of a typical four-story townhouse. You can just imagine, can't you? How many people walked past Noah during those decades of ark building and called up to him, What are you doing, Noah? You can imagine his reply. God is sending a flood to destroy the world. I'm building an ark which God has told me is the way for us to be saved. Can you imagine the laughter, the mocking, the apathy? The ark looked foolish and it's the same as the cross today. For the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 18. And even leading up to the days before the first drop of rain, here was this huge, impressive ark, finished and ready, door wide open, and yet still people walked past. Until on that day, all of the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened, and rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. When those that entered as God had commanded, the Lord shut them in. As the ark door shut, the opportunity in which to be saved had passed forever. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground. And you can be sure that up until the clouds became dark, it would be similar to the common experience we have when we share the gospel today. The gospel that we teach and proclaim is the only way in which to be saved for eternity. Just like back here, the ark was the only way to be saved from the flood. There would have been people that walked past that day, that ark, day in, day out for years. And after a while, they probably just subconsciously faded it out, probably like we do when we walk past something that's been there for years, maybe like the town hall or something. I'm sure there are people that come to church and hear the gospel year in and year out, maybe for some even every week, and yet are still yet to actually get on the ark. Maybe you have family members and friends that love you and have told you of the importance of Christ. And yet it's possible that even though you have heard these things and of your great need of the Lord so many times, that you have still yet to apply this to yourself. I think about this when I'm out and people ignore you as you offer them a gospel tract. When people make remarks as they walk past, in my heart I'm just so sorry that they do not realise that clouds are beginning to form and that the ark door will soon be closed. 
David reminded us a few weeks back that no one knows when it will be the last time that they hear the gospel. The last opportunity to repent and to trust in Christ for salvation. We do not know when Christ will return and nor do we know when we will take our last breath. It's by the grace of God that I even get to finish this sentence and concerning that day and hour of Christ's return, no one knows. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. I plead with you today, just like I I would have if I were standing by the ark in the time of Noah, shouting out at you, asking you to get into the ark. And here I am this morning asking you, pleading with you to understand the absolute eternal danger that you are in if you are not in Christ. Recognise this morning that you and I have lived lives in rebellion to God. A perfect, holy God. We have all fallen short of his glory. Our sin is revealed in his perfect law. And if we are judged for the life that we have each lived, we will be found guilty and will have to face the consequence of that sin, which the Bible describes as hell. But just like the ark was fit to save from the flood, there is a way to be saved. Jesus and this cross. The Son of God, this man that we've been speaking about this morning, came and willingly provided a way for him to take the consequence of my sin and your sin upon himself. He came to earth. He lived a perfect life, making him innocent righteous in the eyes of God and he then offers us that innocence which we receive by faith. He takes our guilty life and he swaps it with his perfect life. And ultimately, this means that as we leave here today and go back home to enjoy our Easter weekends, we have two choices. We can ignore the cross We ignore the only way in which it is possible to be saved. We ignore everything that I've said this morning, everything that Jesus achieved, and we turn our back on Christ and say, no, it's okay. I will take the consequences and the punishment of my sin upon myself for eternity. Or the second option is that we accept that we are guilty. We feel the absolute weight of that guilt and we cry out to God, please be merciful to me, a sinner. God's grace and forgiveness received as a free gift this morning. Infinitely better than an Easter egg. Christ's perfect life for my sinful life. His righteousness for my unrighteousness. His pain for suffering and death so that I can receive grace, mercy and eternal life. A life with eternal happiness. No pain, no war, no disease and death. A new heaven and new earth where we can enjoy everlasting friendship with God who is pure good. His perfect obedience all received by grace through faith. Cry out to the Lord for mercy today. Every one of our sins paid for in full by Jesus on the Roman cross. Come to him today. Recognise your condition for today is the day of salvation. And then it will be true for you also that the debt for your sin is paid in full. It is finished. Let's pray.